Thank you so much, Lucy, and good morning to you, Roseanne Summerson, president of RISD. Great to see you. I'm going to uh, take a wild surmise and guess that you are in Providence, Rhode Island. Very good guess. <laughs> Never far from campus, I would imagine. No, no. I have uh, been I pretty much know. here nonstop yeah. since March. Mm. Yeah. yeah. In this spot, almost. <laughs> <laughs> and in front of this screen, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, if uh, folks have questions as uh, we hear from Roseanne and we have a conversation together with her, please send them uh, to the gallery on the chat box and we'll get back to them in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of the conversation. Uh, but first I wanted to start off, Roseanne, with a little plug actually for another interview that you did because it went into such depth um, and I thought in a remarkably sensitive way on many of the challenges that RISD is facing at the moment. Uh, having said this, this was actually a couple of weeks ago already, and I know things are moving along quickly. But that um, that interview was with the podcast At a Distance, which is a project by Spencer Bailey and Andrew Zuckerman. Um, and I definitely recommend uh, those of you who want to hear even more from Roseanne about the uh, current situation to check that out. But I did want to start our conversation also by asking um, just what's on your mind and how RISD is coping with this unbelievable cascade of events that we've had in 2020 so far, and also, of course, how you're looking ahead to the fall of 2020 student experience, staff and faculty experience. And um, if you could give us a kind of brief sketch of how RISD is trying to navigate these troubled waters. How much time do we have? <laughs> no, I'll be brief. Yeah, right. It's so complex. It's uh, That's, I guess, the first thing I would say, because it's this is, for, without a doubt, the biggest challenge we've faced in our entire history as an institution, 143 years. But we're not alone in that. I mean, everyone's facing it. And so I think what's coming from this time is a real sense of what you value, what matters, what what is your priority. And, you know, in our case, it is providing a RISD kind of education with a lot of in invention attached to it. and. You know, in March, when we were forced to um, send our students back home, or at least off campus, we had so little warning. So, and we did it, I think, incredibly seamlessly, but it was traumatic for the students. I mean, this is not at all what they had anticipated, and it was done sort of to them and to all of us rather than by them. So it was very difficult. and. It raised all kinds of issues of all kinds of inequities and complexities, but our faculty were amazing and really went sort of student by student to create circumstances so that the students could learn the objectives of the classes in very inventive ways. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that today. But since then, you know, the world has changed again five times, and um, you know, we're dealing with trying to imagine a completely reinvented school that has a way of teaching and, and methods of learning that are very successful but can't be used at the moment. So mm -hmm. we're actually rebuilding our entire campus right now for the summer. We're opening in the fall with what we're calling a de-densified manor. So we're essentially taking over all the spaces in campus that we can and making them studios that are that have different you know, distancing procedures, et cetera. We're expanding the space between equipment. We're adding um, opportunities for students to still be in the making facilities, but with the distancing and the protocols for disinfecting, et cetera, that will keep them as healthy as possible. So it's a huge task. And so we're in, we're in the process of going course by course and coming up with three sort of modalities. One fully online, which will be a lot of our critical theory courses and seminar courses that can meet that way effectively. Some that will be hybrid courses where there will be lectures um, online and then making in the facilities and um, some will be fully in person. So it's like, and we have over 800 classes, so we're going class by class and basically rebuilding the space and the teaching space for each class. So it's a very complex um, process, and that's just the academic side. We're doing the same for housing and dining and you know, incredible systems of, for all of that. And we're also inventing numerous online activities and kind of ways to build community, and you know, it, it's a daunting task. But there are some really wonderful things that are happening that wouldn't have ever happened 
Um, for example, we're able to bring in internationally acclaimed critics into our classes who generally wouldn't be able to travel to do critiques. Uh, people like Glenn Adamson ha sometimes has been there in person, but there are some who can't make it there for either age or distance or whatever reason. We're also starting a new thing of uh, artist studio tours and visits, which, you know, so artists are opening up their studios so that our students can sort of have a bird's eye view without traveling. So there are numbers of things that we've learned from this experience that are actually expanding our learning footprint in, in very exciting ways. Hmm. You know, it, it's, uh, it strikes me that in a funny way, art schools are very well set up to cope with the situation because they're filled with creative people who are used to inventing forms of expertise almost on a moment's notice because they're so inventive, um, you know, fundamentally. And I, I've uh, been fortunate enough to be a visiting critic in the printmaking and ceramics departments at RISD. And I definitely saw that both in the reactions of the faculty, but also the students and just seeing what the students were able to come up with over the course of the past two or three months from often just their living room, you know, sometimes in a, in a one room apartment, and what they were able to make just by going outside on their own or at their desk. It was absolutely inspiring to see that. Yeah. And I felt like it was almost modeling a, the way that the culture in general should be responding to this crisis. It was really, really something to see that. Um, I did wanna also ask you, as you said, the, the world has changed so much and there's been so much to think about recently. I also wanted to ask you what the conversations at RISD around the recent Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. inspired and led protests have been. Um, and there have been some statements coming out from yourself and RISD about that, but I wonder if you would also want to, another huge topic, but if you'd want to briefly address that. Sure. Well, they're, they're inextricably linked. A lot of the reason that Black Lives Matter is happening now has to do with politics and police and, you know, 400 years of, of, uh, of an awful legacy. But it also the COVID virus has exposed really deep inequities in uh, populations and healthcare and uh, the, the, the workforce and just every aspect of life. So it's amplified this horrific truth about structural racism in America. And at RISD, our students are very active, our faculty are very active. So we've been having some very difficult conversations. And uh, when I started as president, my first big initiative was a social equity and inclusion initiative and building an office to begin to untangle RISD's um, history in this and really look to the future. And the students are very, were a big part of developing that. They had a lot of voice in that as well. And, you know, now they, um, they don't want to hear about the past. They don't want to see the trajectory of change that we've made, which has been significant, but they're looking at what's wrong now and the right to be doing that. So we have our work cut out for us and we'll be announcing a number of new commitments and initiatives in about three weeks. And, you know, that's just the beginning, but it, uh, I think that for everyone to, to not recognize that this is a movement that is so long overdue and is so um, it's so baked into to to everything that it is absolutely an imperative that everyone begins to admit the fact that they, they may not feel their own you know people say they're not racist but if they're not actively acting against racism they're part of the problem so it has to be a very proactive time and, you know, RISD is going to be a, a strong voice in that change. Mm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the first thing you said, too, which is that the two developments are related. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, the crisis of the pandemic, and on the other hand, this really long overdue um, explosion of awareness and the urgency that's come with that. And the, the horrible fact of the two things being um, you know, occurring at the same time, but also the impact of COVID on the uh, black and brown communities in the country. So there's a huge amount to think about and, and deal with um, institutionally and individually, I guess you might say. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the involvement of the opportunities to, to be involved in the political arena right now and to the amount of change that is in process right now is really moving, but it's, you know, it's long overdue. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're feeling the weight of that um, right. 
that delay that, that these things should have been uh, dealt with by previous generations, but it's our generation that's facing up to them. Okay. Yeah. Um, generations, yeah. Well, let's let's um, look at some images now and go to campus because it will give us uh, maybe some uh, additional feeling for what this response has been like, particularly sure. with respect to the um, to the uh, necessary evacuation of working spaces. Um, and so uh, please uh, take us through this uh, kind of brief tour of what's been happening <laughs> at RISD and kind of response. Sure. So I'm going to give you a snapshot with a few um, projects just to demonstrate the point that I think you made very well, which is the fact that, you know, artists and designers, if you think about their practice, it's making things that have never existed before. It's sort of taking the proverbial blank sheet of paper and bringing it to life. So this notion of dealing with incredible uncertainty and totally new territory is the realm of artists and designers. It's the realm in which they perhaps have the best skill set to, to move forward. So I think it is telling that art and design students um, as traumatic as this experience was, really managed to make some incredible discoveries during this time. And I'm going to try and show you a couple of them. Um, if we can just go to the first slide. This is a, a work that I'll talk about in a minute, but it kind of captured, I think, the way we all felt. It's like the entire mm -hmm. world was just turned upside down instantaneously um, in every way that we knew. And it happened so suddenly without kind of preparation. So it was jarring. And, you know, we we saw everything differently immediately because we had to. Um, if you can go to the next um, slides, that I just there are a couple of images here that just show the kind of um, somber nature of empty creative spaces without students and faculty in them. And, you know, the, the loneliness. And for us, this was Kind of devastating because these are spaces that we um, are usually noting with incredible bustling activity and creativity and instead they look like this i think there might be one more and it, it just kind of captures the feeling of isolation and um, what was left behind but all of the students who who left took that same kind of isolation with them in their different ways sorry we have dogs and stuff happening but this is um Real life. Zoom in the, in the yes. Um, so, um, you know, in addition to that, we have, a, as all higher ed and many cultural institutions, an incredible um, financial crisis that we're also managing at the same time. And that's going to affect us for a long time. Um, but that's uh, something that we're not, again, alone in. This is sign of higher ed and museums and all, a lot of, arts foundations and institutions are suffering the same challenges, but we suffered on a, on a fairly large scale. Um, but there were also wonderful aspects that came out of this. And um, I wanted to show you um, some of the specific projects. Um, this is uh, going to be some examples of a work by glass artist, Sean Sostrom, who's one of our glass faculty. And, People were saying things like, there's no way you can teach something like glass remotely. And, you know, Sean is a fantastic professor, assistant professor. And so he sent all the students home. Um, he was teaching a course on optics and uh, the way that glass and light interact. And so he sent all the students home with a kit that he put together that included a prism, a spherical lens, a high end laser pointer, and a telescope that had a cell phone camera mount so that they could continue to explore and observe light and optics from wherever they were in their uh, uh, classes. And if we go to the next one, um, this is an interesting um, investigation by a student named Amanda Lee, who is a graduate student in the glass department. And she um, was studying the optical behavior of isomalt, which is a beet derived sweetener that can be used as a material substitute for glass. Now, this is probably something that wouldn't have happened in the glass studio because there'd be other wonderful distractions. But, you know, these were the kind of explorations that creative people um, engaged in that had some incredible results. And if we go to the next one, this is this image again by Yu Qing Ma, who's a graduate student in industrial design. And 
For Yuqing, the constrained studio environment of self-isolation itself became a source of inspiration. And so with very simple reflective materials, she created an interap interactive optical environment in her bedroom. And she's now considering translating this into a window that she would have manufactured with the same materials so that any space could be similarly enlivened. So again, sort of a, a new set of discoveries um, that came out of this adversity. Can I just um, add a little comment of my own on, on this point? Oh which is just that one thing that really struck me in talking to the students that I was working with at RISD was that uh, by essentially having to withdraw from the facilities of RISD, which are very impressive, they were almost placed in a position of, that was akin to being an amateur again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you might say, well, the difference between an amateur and a professional is actually more to do with infrastructure and equipment mm -hmm. and sort of uh, institutional positioning than anything else. And it really brought to the fore the individual personality of the students in a lot of cases in ways that was so strong. And I, I am feeling a little bit of that even in these first examples that you've shown, like the very um, strong sense of place and psychology that you get in this image and pers this perspectival nature of it. Mm -hmm. I find that really gets right to the heart of what it is to be an artist in a, in a way. Um, yeah. leaving behind these differences between amateurism and professionalism that we often talk about and take for granted. Yeah, and I think also just the, the capturing in such a simple way of, of what we were all feeling, you know, this kind of upside down, inside out nature of life suddenly. And I would say, um, I think you're right in talking about this as something that sort of defines an amateur. It also defines a an accomplished artist just starting out, you know, that doesn't necessarily have access to all the equipment or all the facilities. So how can you translate the things that you absolutely need and, and have to say with um, other kinds of tools and outcomes? And that's very much the spirit of, of a lot of what happened over this, uh, you know, this spring time. It's kind of economy of means in a way. Exactly. Yeah. So this, this project I, I just find uh, incredibly poetic. Earlier in the semester, um, Sean, this is the same Sean Sostrom's class, had invited Peter Gallison from the Event Horizon Telescope team to give a presentation to the class about his team's work imagining a black hole through a global network of synchronized observations that work in unison to observe radio sources associated with black holes. And so it was the cumulative effect of all the responses around the globe that actually helped to define what um, the, the, the reaction was. And so modeling from that, Sean, um, in a very simple way, wanted to do something similarly, but more poetic. And so he had all of the students from wherever they are um, shoot with the equipment kits that he had sent to them. Images of the moon on May 3rd at 2020 at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so, and the, the time zones in this particular group of students allowed them to all get images at that point. And um, there's a great difference in quality here and clarity, and this is due to some very specific things, which I think add to the power of the image, which is that the students were sort of amateurs with this equipment. They, this was new to them. They, they didn't know how to master the absolute precision of the tel telescope attachment. Um, also, because of their different circumstances and social distancing factors, some were looking directly out of a window, some were looking from an apartment and, you know, with a different skewed perspective. So it also speaks to where they were and, um, and their circumstance. And also, he didn't direct them on how to use the eyepiece, which is the magnification piece. So they all interpreted the, the use of that on their own. And so this became this sort of collaborative homage, in a way, to the moon um, from people viewing one moon from a multitude of circumstances and locations. And again, I think really captures the fact um, that of, of this particular time that we're in where we're all experiencing this pandemic in our own individual ways across the globe. But it is one world and it is one human, you know, well, human and, and animal um, population across the globe that's all sort of experiencing this together. So I, I found this um, very moving in its kind of simple poetic um, gesture. Reminds me a little bit of the way that people have been standing outside to clap for the 
exactly frontline health care yeah. workers in the sense of yeah. being apart and together at the same time and you know everybody directing their gaze in the same way at the same time and focusing on that uh important yeah you know, idea exactly. of connection I, I think it also brings out how we are such um, social beings. And so people are finding all kinds of new ways to create community from isolation. And I'm sure every one of us can tell a story about an old friendship or re something that's been rekindled, you know, through this period when you actually have time to, to think and miss people and miss communication. Yeah. So let's go to the next one and um, talk about another kind of invention, which was uh, a critic in the film animation video studio, Gina Kamensky, and she created um, a step-by-step -step PDF tutorial complete with images and drawings for each student on how to make a down shooting stand out of a cardboard box to shoot animation mm -hmm. so that the students could use their smartphone camera and um, still work on their stopgap animations using this plan. So, I mean, look at how simple this is. And to our earlier conversation about you know, perhaps being a, a, a master, you know, maker, or artist or designer, but not having full access to the tools, the kind of ingenuity piece that comes from learning how to solve a problem this ingeniously is it's a lesson in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at the next slide, this is just one improvised studio um, by Sydney Mills, a junior in the department. And this is a, a stop motion animation studio that she set up, you know, in her Texas room um, so that she could continue working on her animation. And, um, you know, this there are I, I don't want to underplay the fact that they that, that there are benefits to having the full range of incredible facility that we have. But there are also times when um, people may want to be shooting in parts of the world that don't have access to those, or it actually, when you think about access and the ability to um, be more inclusive about who gets to make art and how, there are lots of important lessons here that I think we can learn from and take forward into really interesting new mm -hmm. terrain. Um, I guess, you know, Roseanne, it must be a, kind of a nuanced conversation because as you say, you don't want to, in a way, make the mistake of celebrating the ingenuity that people have in these reduced circumstances to the extent that you uh, either inadvertently disregard the difficulties that they might be having right. in that same situation, or indeed forget how important it is to have all these facilities that RISD has invested so much in and what that brings to an artistic career, you know, just thinking about ceramics, for example, and everything that you really need to be a top flight ceramics practitioner. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a really tricky balancing act to think about, isn't it? The the way that uh, we all respond to this moment of restricted circumstances and how we find our way into celebrating what individual students and faculty are doing without almost going too far in the other direction and, and ignoring the challenges that they're also facing. Yeah, I think it's a a lot about sequencing. I think that you know that. The, the knowledge gained in improvisation um, and in making things happen that needed to happen is a, just an incredible skill set. But it's not instead of um, the ability to then come back and use studios. I think it's having the versatility to be able to function in multiple levels of engagement for your practice is really mm -hmm. the takeaway. And um, both in teaching and making, uh, you know, for the students, for the faculty too, they really had to think deeply about how to get the students experience to be what their intention for the class was. So the faculty also expanded their teaching language and repertoire, mm -hmm. but certainly this is not instead of, it's a part of, I think, a sequence of learning. Yeah, and everyone's on the learning curve, not just the students, that's for sure. Yeah, and, even, <laughs> and, and audiences too, right? The way that we're engaging audiences. Um, this is from our apparel department, and Lisa Morgan, who is the head of the apparel department, wanted her students to um, what she what she called build a muscle of resource while working with less, which is I think mm -hmm. a very nice way to articulate Great. what we're talking about. And um, so she again, a lot of faculty prepared these sort of kits and and uh, pro and materials, etc., to, to send students home with and. For the apparel students, um, some they some of them went home with dress forms and sewing machines and knitting machines and tools so that they could continue. The seniors, of course, have a whole collection that's due at the end of the year. So 
it was very important for them to be able to make their collections. But there have been some wonderful interviews with students about the ingenuity of working with materials around them in their own home, in their own uh, environment that they just had overlooked rather, you know, when, when being more accustomed to acquiring materials in a certain way. And Lisa's approach is very much about thinking more critically about resources themselves and production methods and fashion overall in terms of its impact on the environment. Um, so um, seniors uh, doing their, their year-end shows knew that they had to present them remotely and she urged them to really think about that as an opportunity and devise original ways for communicating their ideas to the fashion industry which would be coming to look at these you know, latest designers and the world beyond. So this is the work of a graduating senior, Desiree Nicole Scarborough, whose hood ice cream collection you see here. And on the next slide um, is one of the places where um, she, she began seeing what you know, Lisa and the student were calling the new possible. So you know, the idea that it's um, there, that out of these kind of um, limitations come incredible opportunities for creativity and for rethinking how we find materials and how we uh, express with them. And um, in her artist statement, Desiree, who's a Brooklyn-based artist, admitted that she felt really uncomfortable to share personal details of her life, but her designs could do that as kind of a bold breakthrough drawing on the experiences of her grandparents and I think a lot of students really connected with their families in different ways because they were sort of forced to and um, but in Desiree's case she was drawing on the experience of her grandparents who came north from the south and her own childhood in Brooklyn and how it shaped the personage of a young black female artist and designer. That's um, fascinating, that thing about being a master's student and also being with your family at the same time and the way that those two experiences can hybridize with one another. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. And I, I was also thinking, Roseanne, that in the future, don't you think that these projects, you know, if, if viewed from a distance of 20 or 30 or 50 years, they're going to seem so resonant of this thing that we've all been through in a way that maybe nothing else does? You know, what does a 20-something-year-old student do to react? And they're so... I just hope there are some museums and curators around there who are going to collect these and keep them safe Absolutely. because it's so powerful. Well, we're doing what we've created in our library. We have an archive. So we're creating an archive of COVID projects um, from students, faculty and alumni to really mark this moment because it is so historic. And mm -hmm. so it, it is very important. And interestingly, a lot of the when we first went remote, I got you know many concerning letters from parents and students in the apparel department wait a minute, you know, we're, we're, the, the launch of our show is so important to our careers. And, you know, that's, that's part of being in a, in a good art and design school is that you expect that the, the public will come to you and the industry will come to you. We had amazing coverage um, for our senior show. We were in W, we were in Vogue, there were videos from our student um, kind of mini runway show sort of things. And this, this particular graduating class got phenomenal connections and publicity out of this. So it is really interesting, the sort of nice surprises that came from this very difficult set of circumstances. And then, am I right in thinking that there's still a master's degree show that's coming in the fall? Is that correct? Yes. So we're going to have a, there is just, we just launched and we can send the link for it, our online um, senior show and graduate shows, which are phenomenal, but we will have in-person shows. Um, we're still working on the scheduling for those based on when we can, you know, get people and enough um, mass to actually attend them. So those things are still being developed by the state. Gotcha. Okay. So if we go to the, um, this project, which was is the Phillips Stell Industrial Village in East Providence. And um, this was a project site for our landscape architecture department. And in their um, core studio, which is a site ecology design studio, they use this site to sort of create a mock RFP for the remediation and transformation of what is a really derelict industrial village on the waterfront in East Providence. And they set this up almost like a competition would run so that they were mirroring what they would experience in the professional world, which was a slightly different approach than they were going to take when they were working on campus. 
um, but they wanted to look at this site as a potential site for um, social interaction, for some kind of dynamic industrial innovation and sustainability uh, around biodiversity. So the um, instructors created a website, and we can go to the next slide, that gave a very specific um, detailed project brief that would be the kind of thing that would happen in a professional competition. And um, they also included, because of the fact that it was digital, they were able to in incorporate an extensive archival documentation about the history of the site. And they grouped students into design teams. And students got really excited by this new exercise because it was so much a mirror of how they might work in the professional world. And, um, but it was certainly not without its challenges. Um, it, they didn't necessarily have the tools that they typically have for using for making models. So we set up a kind of um, uh, shop in a um, using some of our printing machines and laser cutters and digital fabrication stuff on site and then had a container that made parts for students. And in some cases, the local students were able to pick them up and use them for models. But there was some material that got sent to other students. So again, finding a way to work that mirrors what might be more typical in the professional setting than in a setting where you have every kind of tool you know, at your finger's reach. Mm -hmm. And um, landscape architecture firms, as I'm sure many you know, listeners know, are increasingly staffed by designers who work collaboratively from remote locations. So this was a great opportunity to try that and give them a taste of that. And um, if we go um, to the next two slides, these are just some of the studies that um, were created for part of the proposal by two Chinese students, Lulu Hao and Yu Zhao. And the next slide, um, these are some of the uh, studies that they did to talk about aspects of components that would be um, dealing with both the eco reality of the site and also um, the development of the site. And if we go to the next one, um, this is kind of the, the more final stage of the design that shows the different uses and um, circulation pattern of uh, development on the site. And if we go to the next one, um, I wanted to show another project by uh, our interior architecture department because our department is very much centered around um, adaptive reuse. And when it comes to issues of architecture and sustainability, you know, one could argue that the greenest green use of buildings is reuse of buildings. And so we have um, a wonderful publication called INTAR that the department also publishes that really features um, exemplar uh, works that use that concept of adaptive reuse. And um, we're kind of known globally for that, for being leaders in that field. And this summer, our graduates, I'm sorry, this spring, our graduate students took on an iconic building, which I'm sure you know, Glenn, in Providence. You can go to the next slide, called the Superman Building. And it's actually um, the, uh, the real name is the Industrial Trust Building, but it's a sort of iconic Art Deco building in the middle of Providence, and it's a pretty much an a, a exact um, s s a similar building to the Daily Planet building in Superman, which is why it's called the Superman Building. And actually, recently, this has um, been included in the National Trust list of America's 11 most endangered historic places, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. But it's a very um, iconic part of the Providence landscape. And so a new um, owner recently built it named David Sweetser, who is a very, I haven't had a chance to meet him yet, but I understand he's very imaginative about what this building might become. So he engaged our students to collaborate um, with the Providence Preservation Society and the City Planning Office on possible new uses. And so the students started out by touring the building. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is a really interesting intervention, which is uh, Shriya Anand's super farmer concept, which um, Providence is a city that has a very active and renowned food culture. In part, Johnson & Wales is there, which has a great culinary program. Um, but, and there's a, because it's such a small region with so many fabulous growers, there's a real artisanal farm and producing um, uh, network here that, 
the restaurants and a, and a lot of uh, suppliers are all connected. So this, uh, so Anand proposed converting this landmark building into a vertical farm using state-of-the-art hydroponic technology, and then the monumental lobby would become a kind of Kunsthall for a changing exhibition of the history of food and the culinary arts, and then the bank vault which was a, it's a very impressive part of the building, would become a national seed repository so that it had this archive of seeds. And then the top floors would house several um, farm to table restaurants. So it's a really interesting um, take on a building that was completely in a different direction than I think anyone had thought of um, prior to that time. And if you go to the next slide, um, if you have a, a phone that you want to print the QR code, you can get a whole augmented reality scene of the interior um, of the building and what it would look like after its farm conversion. And I don't know, maybe we can post the QR code later if people want to play with that. Um, and if we go to the next slide, uh, this uh, uh, there is a lot of interest in, of course, augmented reality. And in interior architecture, there is a very strong interest also in exhibition design. So this is a uh, image that um, graduating s majors in the department wanted to create an augmented reality version of a senior show in um, a replication that they created of the Grand Gallery of the RISD Museum. And um, if you download their app, you can actually play with this, but I'm just going to show you a couple of images. So if you go to this one and you click, you can see that it's an interactive um, image of the students' exhibition in the gallery um, so that you can look into these um, viewing things and see the kind of spaces and constructions that the student created. So it was a very inventive way of creating an exhibition. And if you um, go into the next slide, um, it will use some of the um, same kind of thinking in a large project that was a multidisciplinary project and um, at Glenn as you know we have a, found, a very famous and special facility at RISD the renowned um, Edna Lawrence Nature Lab this is just one room of it but it has um, over 80,000 natural history specimens it's, it's an extraordinary resource we also have a menagerie of living animals including some small mammals reptiles fishes anthropods mollusks jellyfish and other invertebrates and we have um, really high-end data visualization equipment, electron microscopes. Um, we can freeze dry things. We have wet labs. We have a um, living lab um, in the space that has a green growing wall and a place for biomaterial making. So it's quite elaborate. And um, we are starting to use it really as building on it as a research site um, to look at the interaction between um, the systems of nature and the systems of design and the future. So we partnered um, on a kind of multi-semester work with Hyundai Motor Corporation to propose new directions for the future of mobility. And students um, in this work uh, considered strategies that were as far-ranging as interspecies collaboration, questioning whether the unique and symbiotic cycle of humans and the rest of the natural world might partner to sort of harness novel outcomes rega regarding movement and transport, and also investigating the potential of eco-repair in their scheme. So asking questions that could human activity actually contribute to restoring the natural environment rather than negatively impact it. And if we go to the next slide, um, this research, this is an example in um, the, our uh, materials making, biomaking uh, area where we have this living wall and some of our aquariums and other natural, real living um, environments. And uh, these are some of the students who were part of the team. There were four faculty members that led separate research groups, each bringing particular design strains to the questions that Hyundai was very openly presenting to us to explore. They were incredibly um, wonderful partners in this project and it was a very competitive school of, pool of students to get in and some of the, the four different areas, one was Anthropocene to Aerocene through Biocene, which was a group that explored um, alternative trajectories to the future of mobility, guided by artistic and scientific and philosophical provocations. There was another group called Sound Design for Mobility 
that drew from the fields of bioacoustics and soundscape ecology to develop nov novel auditory displays and sonic experiences in, in a project that they called Making the Unheard Heard. And we're very fortunate to have a, um, a sound studio, um, a spatial sound studio that is a very special facility that the students worked in for that project. And then another one was called Post-Human Mobility from Molecule to Machine that focused on developing models for collaboration directly with diverse forms of nature, such as designed nature and cyborg nature, and looking at interspecies collaboration so that um, different forms of life could evolve together in regard to movement and transport, which is not typically the way that mobility is thought about. And I was especially intrigued by some of the work of a textile design for mobility group. These are some of the members of that group. And if we go to the next slide, um, they speculated on the future of mobility in regard to mass migration that was a result of climate and political change, and also personal mobility and temporary shelters and wearables. So that wearables could become shelters as well. So crossing the kind of deliberate line between wearable temporary shelters and, in a sense, architecture and fashion or architecture and apparel. And um, they took inspiration from this image, Ar Archigram's 1968 Cushicle and Sutaloon, which was a, a nomadic expandable shelter for the wearer. Those of us who lived through the 60s remember a lot of interest in nomadic shelter and nomadic housing. And this was a kind of wearable mobile home, which was a speculative design for a personal individual portable dwelling unit. And um, the students were really inspired by this and led by the faculty member, Anna gittleson Khan. the four students were Daphne Chen, Ben Doctor, Noah Kant Kantrowitz, and Elise Hugh. And if we go to the next slide, um, they started getting fascinated, believe it or not, by cockroaches. And in the Nature Lab, we have an entomologist who was talking about the notion of what makes a durable portable structure that allows for mobility and intense protection at the same time, and what better creature than the cockroach that can kind of live anywhere through anything. So they, they took a really deep dive into what made the cockroach such a successful structure and habitat. And if we go to the next slide, um, they looked at, this is a, um, a kind of dissection of the structure that allows the cockroach to have such adorable home um, that it wears. So it sort of fit directly into this line of research. And it's um, kittenous exoskeleton and respiratory system ena enable it to, in a very sophisticated way, regulate its physiology so that it can thrive in high temperatures with little waters, and also can survive extreme compression, which became really fascinating to the textile artists who really understand the notion um, of some of these elements and the way that they approach structural textiles. So if we go to the next one, this is also an animation um, that was a, a demonstration made um, to demonstrate the compression shell that allows the cockroach to breathe, how it takes in and lets out air. And so these principles were really studied through this 3D modeling technique. And one of the um, nice outcomes of, again, the students not having their regular tools and equipment was that none of them had done 3D modeling before. And they learned in a very short time to do these very sophisticated 3D models and renders and animations because they had to. So it opened up a whole new form of language for the, um, for the team. And then this one is also an animation that dissects the individual parts that make the structure and it's just a wonderful way to think about the kind of structures that could then be adapted to textile structures. And if you go to the next slide, um, this, this is a, a final study. This one doesn't animate, but it shows the structural composition of the skeleton that actually um, demonstrates how you could make a kind of spacer knit, is what they called it, which would be a double-layered circular knit with a cushion of air and spring-like yarns between the two sides so that it could replicate that sort of breathing apparatus and could sustain impact but also regulate temperature and be self-insulating. So very sophisticated um, derivation from a cockroach, right? 
And if you look at um, the actual uh, result on the next slide, um, this is actually what the first knitted version with that kind of internal structure. So this is what two layers might look like in an actual knit. So through their research, they demonstrated the potential of developing a customizable, modular, and accessible textile that could be used for the creation of consumer goods at the intersection of architecture and apparel. In short, you know, the description of a wearable temporary shelter. So it was such an interesting process. And of course, Hyundai was very excited to be taken along on this adventuresome journey. And this, this work is actually continuing through the summer. They're going to be taking their early findings now to the next level. And so I think this is a kind of good example of, you know, the new possible that we're talking about, about taking the, the difficulty of really challenging in some ways even traumatic circumstances and making something so positive and valuable and grow and, and so growth inducing to come out of it. And, um, you know, it is in our mission, uh, maybe we can go to the last slide that, you know, we were always formed around working with industry, the, the original uh, purpose of RISD was very much about innovating in materials and with industry and for new economies and to bring the notion of design and making and fabrication into a continual level of, of evolution. It's very much still in our kind of DNA. And um, not long after Rhode Island went into lockdown, the Governor Raimondo, uh, Gina Raimondo, reached out to me about her, her hope that we could find a way that art could play a role in bringing Rhode Islanders together during this incredible anxious isolated period. So I put her in direct contact with Shepard Ferry who um, mm -hmm. is an alum and a trustee. He graduated in 92 and he's probably most known um, for many of you as the um, artist who created the Obama Hope poster which is you know renowned and um, if she got in touch with Shepard and Shepard very generously jumped to the um, to the cause because he loves Rhode Island. And a few weeks later, um, the governor announced this hashtag Rhode Island Arts Initiative, which was encouraging individuals all around the state from children to professional artists to use art as a means of healing and community building and sharing. And she also unveiled uh, Shepard's Rhode Island Angel of Hope and Strength, which um, Shepard created as a kind of monument of thanks to the first responders and also to the resilience of the Rhode Island community. So this image here is a projection. It's not actually on the building. We projected it around the city for many days in April when things were really difficult. Um, in our experience of COVID, it's gotten better since then, but this was kind of at our peak. So it really resonated with people. And then Shepard also created a way on, you can download it on the, RISD, on the sorry Rhode Island COVID site a way to print this out and have your own copy of this. And then his hope was that it would be displayed in windows, not just in Rhode Island, but around as a sort of thanks to first responders and symbol of hope. So um, again, um, I think a nice way to end this uh, part of our talk to talk about the new possible and the new yeah. ways of building community. Such a great image to leave it on, Roseanne. The, Thank you. The sort of beacon of hope. Um, I also have to just um, admire the dark humor of accepting the cockroach as a an emblem of survivance and uh you know structural integrity at this time i kind of yeah. like the, the mordant uh commentary that you might associate with that well, I, um, didn't, I didn't you know just because of time i didn't play the sound group actually recorded the cockroach and you have no idea what cockroaches sound like when their sound is magnified it's like a haunting kind of animal sound but anyway um, maybe another lecture we can do the sound version yeah great okay <laughs> so it's a date um, and I'm, I'm almost inclined to ask you how you're gonna get that Superman building to be filled with farmland but instead I'm gonna go to the <laughs> the, the viewer questions so we have a few um, so let's see let's start with Julius Kavira uh, there are a couple of long questions in the chat box but Julius uh, please join us in person if you like Asked a question, and maybe too technically challenged to do that. Okay, so let's let's try uh, reading it aloud. Oh no, I mean, could you hear me now? Or? Yeah, good. I'm really sorry for that. <laughs> it's always a little bit of a hiccup. Yeah, please go ahead and um, and tell us what's on your mind. 
Yeah, when I uh, came in um, in the beginning of the, I was a little late. I'm sorry about that, but um, there was we were talking about uh, race and um, and so forth, and there was a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, uh, current events that I think that we should not, um, you know, uh, forget and let it, you know, uh, get overshadowed by all these wonderful other topics that um, is prevailing, whether whether that be you know politics, whether that be weather, <laughs> um, and um, the hashtag Me, Me Too movement. I'm not saying that you know, but I think that um, culturally, um, when it comes to uh, civil rights, I think that we should really um, um, tackle that. And there's certain uh, questions I brought up. Um, it was uh, how would um, can I forget? I'm looking at my old question. I thought, I thought the question about name dropping was particularly interesting, if you maybe want to read oh, that. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's very cool. Um, so in my, in my critiques in my undergraduate, um, there was a lot of uh, students that would say, well, I, I'm, I'm urban and um, it is direct influence in my work and they would have um, a, a rendition of it, uh, of a tile which would be abstract or even just an abstract work and it was, it was very troubling for me because I, I myself wouldn't know where to begin to um, tackle that uh, in the classroom and as me and as as I want to be a teacher or um, or instruct or be I don't know some kind of influence how would I tackle that um, when I'm in that situation it's a uh, it's kind of troublesome and I would love to hear your, your input um, and you know as well as as a whole I mean, it, I mean not only do I feel responsible I feel that everybody is responsible and I wouldn't want to be the only one who's who's um, being um, how you say uh, accountable hmm. okay yeah I mean it's impossible to teach right now without changing your teaching practice to understand the embedded um, issues of denying race problems. Every faculty member has to redo their curriculum and syllabi right now. And at RISD, we've created this teaching and learning lab where we're actually um, engaged in a project called Decolonializing the Curriculum. And 12 faculty each semester are being released from a class and going and doing this work to understand how to bring new influences into the classroom, how to really look at the um, what they're using as references and how they're talking about the histories of their fields because there's so much baked into those histories that is continued racism. So it's it's a, a not going to happen overnight for sure, but the important thing is that schools recognize what the problems are and just make a commitment to moving forward, changing the curricula, to be inclusive, to recognize the, the, the different questions that uh, individuals who have had very different lives and who experience very different realities just walking out the door of their homes, what their experiences are that all of that has to reconfigure what happens in the classroom and how it's taught. And so we're going through a major upheaval in education finally. And I would say at RISD, we're not um, as far and I will not in any way say that we're where we need to be. We are at the start of this, although I think we are ahead of some places we're way behind where we need to be. So we're taking this on with real intentionality. Um, it is the future and the, the demographic shifts that are happening in the world and in America demand this because any educational structure that is not reconfiguring its content and its expectations of what excellence is and what legacy means, those are all loaded terms. And if anyone um, re refuses to take it on, they're going to be irrelevant in 10 years. And I don't want to see RISD certainly be irrelevant. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your question, um, Julian. And uh, let's now go to Mina Satnarian, who I think, Mina, you might have a related question for Roseanne. Sorry, I can't hear. Yeah, no, we're getting her yet. Um, I'll just go ahead and uh, read it. It's a short question. In RISD's attempt to understand the structural racism that affects the educational process, what you've just been describing, does the school wish to involve concerned alumni in this task? And she says she herself is an alumna. 
<laughs> so absolutely. what's the role of the alumni in the, in the um, conversation we're having? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a, I mean, RISD is a community and being an alumna is just a different phase of your relationship with the institution. So absolutely, you know, we, um, it has to be not just in the classroom, it has to be uh, something that the inst entire institution takes on, it has to be at the leadership level. And, you know, I think that's one of the hardest um, areas to change because there aren't, there isn't a lot of turnover in, you know, in certain leadership positions, but we are, our board is on board and we're working very hard to uh, look at a board that is representative of our communities, our student communities. And so we've made a lot of progress in the last few years, but the board is absolutely committed to this work. And, you know, we've created this social equity and inclusion center with an incredible leader, um, Dr. Matthew Shinoda, who is um, building a whole office of um, resource and action that um, is initiating a number of things that will that have have begun to bubble in the last few years and, and have had impact, but is really just getting rolling. So the, the viewpoints of alums are, are critical um, mm -hmm. to know how your RISD education re resonates in the world and what your experiences were and what you can help us frame in our understanding of what they should be moving forward. Mm, great. Thank you. Um, and let's take out, I think, one, just one last question. Um, which is from Fahad al Obadli. Fahad, are you with us? Hi. Hi, Hi Fahad. Good to see Hi. you again. Hi, Hi. Hi. nice to see you again. Uh, it's an amazing session. Thank you so much, Rosan. Like, literally, like what the first pictures you showed was resonating with us because here in Qatar we have Virginia Commonwealth University and the campus look exactly the same. And it, almost terrifying um actually like some of the question was already answered uh, in the chat room but like there's one question what i'm really interested in uh, more about like the uh, is the university uh, it's funded because i know it's privately funded um uh, like uh, what fundraising method like the university follow in order to like remain or make sure like it's more sustainable uh is it by the board or there is a different style of fundraising sure so we have a whole division of institutional engagement which oversees fundraising and alumni relations and government relations and so we look we have a very complex um, staff of people who are engaging uh, involvement with the school in all different ways from grants and you know foundation funding to private individual funding and um, what's exciting i think and important and it relates to the conversation we've been having around change is that we can set our priorities and build around those. So for example, we just in instituted a program for the first time where we have six fully funded graduate educations now at RISD. And the kind of student that we attracted to that program would never have come to RISD because it's a very expensive school. And the, the students that got in are stellar. They're going to be leaders in the field moving forward. But the opportunity of opening access, you know, to a free RISD education for, you know, I wish it were more, but as a start for six individuals was 100% because of fundraising. So, and, well, the combination of fundraising and our priorities kind of finding one another. Um, but it's, uh, as, as time goes on, the, the model of higher ed is completely unsustainable. And it's something that we were looking at very carefully in our strategic plan before the COVID pandemic, and now we have a big setback. So we're going to have to use the same methodology that I've been showing you in the creativity of our, our students in taking adverse times and making something magical happen. We're gonna now have to do that to an institution and figure out how to make the priorities that we feel are essential for art and design education come through with all of the incredible challenges we have financially um, and all higher education and arts culture uh, institutions are facing. So fundraising is a key part. And if you know of anyone that's interested in supporting higher education at the Rhode Island School of Design, please put them in touch with me. <laughs> that's a precedent at work. Uh, thanks, Fahad, for your question. And Roseanne, can I just ask you one last question just for myself? Sure. So we've known each other for a long time. Yes. And of course, we first came into contact with one another through the Furniture Society. Yes. And you were 
and still are a great furniture maker designer. I understand you have had long, long had a practice of making at least one project per year just to keep your hand in literally. Yeah. And what I want to ask you is, do you think your background as a furniture maker and designer prepared you for this moment? And if so, how? Yeah, no, I get asked this a lot. I got asked it in a different way where people said, how was it for you to give up your practice as a designer maker? And, um, and I, you know, my answer was always, I haven't given it up. It's just, I'm using the same um, methodologies to actually help to build a school and a series of fields. So it's transferable information. I believe that a real education is not one where you learn how to do a thing. It's where you learn how to build a body of knowledge that gives you the flexibility to do multiple things with that knowledge and build on a foundational set of competencies and critical ways of thinking about problem formulation and then making new outcomes. You know, that's in any design field, in any making field, if, if you take it at, at that level of kind of the, 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 the intersection between the intellect and the desire to say something new and the making of that thing. So it's very much, uh, I, I wouldn't say, I don't want to be, you know, trite and say that RISD is like a giant piece of furniture. It's not. It's many other things and it's very complex. But as a leader, I think a design education is about the best, um, that and some financial knowledge and some knowledge of things like boards and, the, and laws and compliance and a million other boring things. But the design education itself, I think, is really what's needed to help um, higher education get through an unbelievably challenging time and that will last into the future. Great, thank you. Um, I know I said that was going to be my last question, but I do have one more. Would you like to introduce your adorable dog? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would love to. She usually is much fluffier, but um, this is Cleo, and uh, she um, has been uh, she, she ah. completely completely spoiled by having um, a, a constant companion since March. I don't know what's going to happen when we go off remote. Um, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. devastating. Yeah. I'm sure you've, you've heard the, uh, the joke circulating the rounds that this is all a conspiracy by the dogs. <laughs> They're finally getting exactly what they wanted. Um, okay, well, um, next time we have a, a really uh, fantastic guest who is actually going to help us fill in some of the conversations we've just had about race and institutional dynamics. And that's Craig Wilkins, who's a noted historian of um, the African-American role uh, and subjectivity in architectural history. And he's particularly going to be sharing his thoughts about uh, what he calls hip hop architecture, which is a very dynamic and expansive concept. And you'll just have to tune in to um, understand the full measure of it. Uh, so please join us again on Friday. And um, last but certainly not least, I just want to thank you, Roseanne, for joining us today. It's been fantastic to talk to you. And I just feel like in the future, historians will also be turning back to this conversation. I'm so glad we have it recorded because you're really at the front lines here. And you know, I think everybody in the art and design field owes you a great debt of gratitude for everything you're putting to, to the cause. So thanks so much Thank for- Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank uh, you, Freeman Bend. It was great. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye everyone. <laughs>